introducing the guest speakers by I'll do that. I'll do yeah. that. Yeah. I just mentioned in general, uh, Pablo, please allow me to say a couple of words about the collateral event as well. Perfect. Tell me when you want to start. You're streaming. I think. We can hear a background noise, actually. I'm trying to see if that's on my end. Since we are recording, I'm going to start. Good morning in New York and good afternoon in Venice. And thank you so much for being with us. I am Maria Perbellini, the Dean of the School of Architecture and Design at New York Tech. Today's book discussion is hosted uh, within the collateral event Students as Researchers creative practice and university education that I curated together with uh, New York Tech professors, Marcella Del Signore, Atina Papadopoulou, and Sandra Manninger, and is located at the Armenian Culture Studies and Documentation Center in Dorsoduro in Venice, in Italy. Our event, um, is let me give you a very brief uh, background. Our event is one of out of nine collateral events admitted by Leslie Loco, curator of the 18 International Architecture Exhibition titled The Laboratory of the Future and organized by La Biennale di Venezia. And we are thrilled about the presence and contribution of 20 universities with 25 student projects from all over the world, translated and composed into a collective installation, University Dialogues, which embodies the candid reflections developed by the students in a broad variety of investigations and with the support of faculty tutors. Our purpose for the collateral event is supported by the commitment to provide a resonating platform for ongoing and actionable efforts toward the imagination of future ways of being in the world. And we want to explore a range of possibilities to build an active role within experiential learning addressing investigations on urban adaptation and climate change, the well being and safety of inclusive communities, but also, and this book presentation is fitting extremely well in what we are very sensitive about, which is the critical role of, of innovation and emerging technologies. We can be preventive. And we can also proactively and creatively anticipate transformative processes and continuously evolving learning experiences that prepare students to engage with leading design practices and research trajectories. So in addition to the exhibition that is at the uh, center at the Armenian Culture Center, we also include, until the end of the Biennale in November, um, events and multimedia exhibitions, workshops, symposia, publications, presentations, dialogue, conversations, book launches, and more. We have a very rich program. And today, uh, as part of all these activities, we are very pleased to welcome to the conversation on artificial intelligence, and particularly the presentation of Pablo Lorenzo Eiroa's book that was just uh, published by Routledge, and it has already attracted uh, great interest. And the title is Digital Signifiers in an Architecture of Information from Big Data 
and simulation to artificial intelligence. I would like just quickly uh, quote um, the book content. The book proposes a new critical relationship between computation and architecture, developing a history and theory of representation in architecture to understand and unleash potential means to open up creativity in the field. And I would like now to extend a warm welcome to Professor Pablo Lorenzo Eroa, to Professor Marcella Del Signore. She will follow with an introduction. And to the guest respondent and moderator, Professor Alexis Mayer. And please, Marcella, I would like to invite you to continue with the program. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending our event today. Thank you, Dinter Bellini, for the opening remarks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and be in Venice virtually and, uh, and uh, uh, really be part of this uh, important event as part of our uh, continuous event during the Biennale. Hello, everyone. So again, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, Marcella Del Signore, an associate professor and director of the MS in Urban Design uh, at New York Institute of Technology, School of Architecture and Design. And also, as Dean Perbellini mentioned, um, uh, one of the three deputy curators, along with Atina Papadopoulos and Sandra Manninger of the Students as Researcher Venice Biennale Collateral Event. So I'm very excited to introduce the event now in more detail, but particularly to introduce the speakers for, uh, for this book launch. So the book discussion today is titled Artificial Intelligence, Digital Signifiers in an Architecture of Information from Big Data and Simulation to Artificial Intelligence. The book is written by Pablo Lorenzo Roa, PhD, Director of the AI Research Lab and Associate Professor at New York Tech School of Architecture and Design. And the book, the book is published by Routledge, London, 2023. So in particular, the, boost, the book discusses research anticipating the role of big data and simulation necessary to activate what is being called AI. Big data and statistical prediction are essential to activate parallel processing emergent programming as well as generative AI uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Proposing an architecture of information compatible within the 21st century, the book takes sections through history redefining architecture theory based on big data, forensic surveys, and expanded machine vision simulations, exploring non-intuitive data and modeling relationships, deconstructing history to expand new possible futures. In particular, the book traces critical relationships between technology and culture, displacing specific media and mediums to be able to convey specific messages. For instance, data and AI bias as lack of cultural criticism or design as a cultural confirmation bias. Also, the book expands relationship between computation and architecture, including the definition of new fields of knowledge, deconstructing neocolonialism implicit in a digital feudalism, from measurement and representation system, data bias and anticipatory computation to expanding authorship to critical relationship between data science and computer science. After Nietzsche's Every Word is a Prejudice and Bart's Language as an Author, natural language processing, prompt engineering grammar, activate computer programming, projecting conventional semantics, a context to which we define and expand relationship between a computational linguistic semiotics, a computational visual semiotics, and an informational semiotics. The crisis of representation of nature is redefined by thermodynamics, expanding architecture and urbanism as emergent space environments. And we propose to deconstruct the conventional artificial origination of science in computation towards a metal, a historical, multidimensional architecture of information. So with that, I have the pleasure to introduce the two speakers today. So our speakers are the author of the book, Pablo Lorenzo Iroa, PhD, uh, Director of AI Research Lab, again, Associate Professor at the School of Architecture and Design at New York Tech. Uh, Dr. Paolo Lorenzo Iroa is an Associate Professor, Director of the AI Lab, and also the first Founding Director of the MS in Architecture and Computational Technologies Program at uh, SOED at New York Tech. 
is an international architect and scholar in the field of architecture, urbanism, ecology, and computation. His work innovates in an information-based representation and construction system through materials, robotics, and digital fabrication. He received his doctor in architecture degree from UIC Barcelona and his architecture degree from University of Buenos Aires, where he completed studies for his second master's degree and a postgraduate seminar at the Superior School of Fine Arts de la Cornova, uh, Corcova. He then won the Fulbright and the National Endowments for the Art Scholarship to complete his first MR2 at Princeton University. Professionally, Lorenzo Roa is a design principal of experimental practice e-architects based in New York and Buenos Aires, based on an emerging architecture and urbanism of information. E-architects develop software, information mapping and visualization, implementing big data, including machines to draw and machines to build, understanding them as proto-architectural. His built work includes park building and installation in Buenos Aires, New York and Europe. I have all now the pleasure uh, to introduce as a responder and moderator, uh, I would like to welcome Alexis Mayer, PhD, architect. So Alexis is an architect, is an associate professor in theory and practice of architecture and urbanism. He's at the AU, ASBU master's degree, AMUP lab at the National Institute of Applied Science in Strasbourg. Alexis Mayer is an architect and doctor in urban and architectural conception theory and project. He started his career in the architect, with the architect Peter Eisenman in New York and with Renzo Piano in Paris. He's a university lecturer at the INSA in Strasbourg and collaborates with NSAS since 2009. His research deal with the understanding of mechanics at work in the project conception. He's also interested in the modeling of new organizational logics flow of forms, information, and material that creates new links between the person, the space, and the environment. He develops managing strategies to redefine the traditional urban systems. So please join me in welcoming our uh, speakers and moderators. Uh, and I will now have the pleasure to pass the, the floor to um, Pablo for the book presentation. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Marcela. Thank you, Dean Maria Parvelini. And thank you uh, to the co-curators of this event, uh, the amazing participation of uh, New York Institute of Technology at the Venice Biennale. I'm honored uh, to be here, and I thank you for all the organization and the possibilities. The co-curators, uh, of course, Marcela, again, uh, always everywhere. Thank you so much for all the work that you do for NYIT. Uh, Sandra Manninger and Atina Papadopoulos, who is also the chair of the Lectures and Event Committee. So thank you, everybody, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present to you the ideas of the book. Um, the, uh, this is the first presentation that I do on the book uh, after it's published. I just received the copy of the book uh, two weeks ago. It looks actually very well. Uh, it's very well printed, so I'm very happy. Uh, it was a lot of work through several years. Uh, so here we have the copy. Alexi Meyer's uh, critique is actually in the back, a very precise critique, so we're going to talk about it. Uh, I just wanted to say that in this first presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, the relationship between computation and language, especially not only because it's uh, an, as an aspect of my research that I've been working through the last uh, 20 years, but also because of the relevance of uh, natural language processing. Uh, so this first presentation is going to be specifically about language. I'm going to try not to show too many images uh, to save for a presentation that I'm doing uh, in two weeks or three weeks from now that is going to focus on practice. So this first uh, introduction is going to be more theoretical and the uh, following one is going to be actually dialectical, is going to focus on uh, urban systems and mobility that we're actually exploring uh, in the city of New York and that we want to apply in Europe. So um, giving a a little background of myself. Uh, in 2010, we did with Aaron Sprecher and Yai Shai Yehayahu, Acadia 2010, uh, in which we explored, uh, at least I presented the problem of the bias in computation, which at the time was not, uh, people were not so familiar with it, uh, and the problem of authorship in relationship to uh, a background coding. In 2013, we published with Aaron Sprecher Architecture Information, in which we invited uh, guest uh, editors and, and, and writers to discuss what is, uh, what is the possibility for an architecture of information. 
And we divide in different uh, chapters and different uh, spectrum all the way from data to uh, issues of perception, such as affect. And in this uh, book, I discuss uh, more formally what was a digital signifier. And uh, I discuss the theory of what I meant by authorship in uh, trying to uh, critique and expand uh, Negro Ponte's uh, idea of uh, machinic authorship. The, this, uh, in the last years, I was, uh, uh, by the way, in the, in the uh, architecture information book, uh, I anticipated the necessity to actually work with parallel processing and uh, blockchain as a bifurcating uh, network structure. And uh, uh, the interesting thing was that uh, in the since 2013 until now, uh, artificial intelligence actually started having certain degree of functionality thanks to big data. Uh, so since 2010, I've been uh, working uh, quite hard on big data and what big data means for architecture on many aspects. On the one hand, uh, with API, and on the other hand, with uh, increasing signal levels, such as uh, laser 3D scanning and photogrammetry, trying to develop our own data sets and our own databases and our own da data repositories, anticipating what was coming uh, since I was familiar with what Google was doing and Facebook was doing, I thought that we had to resist uh, that problem and create our own data sets. Uh, this is a, a little uh, meant to be a little bit of my evolution in my relationship with computation. I started uh, scripting in a school, a very special school in the 1980s, when the first PC came up, uh, I was able to start uh, with basic programming. Uh, we in the in high school we saw a little bit of Pascal and C, and then in the 1990s I, st I started getting familiar with artificial neural networks thanks to actually to my mother. Uh, my mother worked uh, with researchers of Palo Alto Institute uh, who were studying with Bateson on the problem of uh, adversarial feedback, which is one of the things that we discuss in the book. Uh, then through the years, I, uh, I'm not going to go through everything that is on the slide, but through the years, I became uh, more and more interested on the problem of emergent, uh, emergent programming and simulation. Uh, if you know my work, you know that I've been working on simulation for several years uh, with computational fluid dynamics, on the one hand, as a form of big data simulation, but also other types of simulations such as expanded art, uh, uh, virtual reality and so on. Uh, the interesting thing to me uh, happened around 2017 with the GANs, uh, Generative Adversarial Networks. But today I'm going to uh, focus on linguistics because I think that what's going on uh, with the current uh, concern about bias uh, is that uh, I declare, I had a, a statement that uh, thinks that the current AI bias is because the neoliberal uh, agenda is displacing humanities from education. I think that that's the first problem that we have. AI is uh, it lacks of cultural criticism because of the way the neoliberal model has been uh, presenting technology as a uh, as a impulsing uh, force for our society, and the lack of criticism of how that technology is applied, all the cultural baggage that that. Uh, technology uh, is embedded with. I think that technology has bias uh, because technology is done by developers and the developers have ideas about representation of reality. And we're going to discuss specifically how they, uh, they are conveyed. Uh, the book has five sections, uh, representation, semiotics, dimensionality, actualization, and simulation. These are big titles. Within them, there are different discussions and different uh, different levels of the, the, the problematization of what these big titles are. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them because I expect that you buy the book and that you go through the book, but the idea is to give you uh, uh, a picture of the complexity of the book. Uh, this book took me a lot of time to develop, actually. I, I, it's part of my PhD uh, research uh, at WIC with uh, Alberto Steves and Alexi Meyer next to me, and uh, also uh, research done at the New York Institute of Technology and at, at the Cooper Union. Uh, the table of contents uh, goes through problems of history, trying to develop a, an alternative history of architecture by not only developing our own surveys, but actually uh, deconstructing 
how theory was based on a certain particular lenses of uh, history. So in that sense, I follow uh, Tafuri's uh, sections of history, and I try to disarticulate what is uh, known about certain buildings, and we develop alternative histories about them. Uh, and then at the end, the book deals with thermodynamics and computational fluid dynamics, uh, specifically in terms of uh, emerging space environments. But within those two things, and then this multidimensionality in between, I'm going to focus, as I said today, in linguistics and visual semiotics. Uh, the, the paragraph that Marcella read today is one of the posts that I did in Facebook. So I, I thank Marcella for the clarity of introducing uh, the subjects of the book in relationship to uh, what I've been trying to articulate, which is uh, how do we deal with the fact that uh, computation uh, deals with language and mathematics? It's not mathematics alone. Most of the people think that computation is only mathematical, and it's not. Uh, it's alphanumeric. Uh, it's, uh, it's about the relationship between language and mathematics because they are uh, statements such as that needs to be proven valid or not, uh, thanks to the discrete logic of algorithms. And we're going to discuss in certain diagrams how that works. Uh, the, in future lectures, I'm going to discuss uh, more particularly the opposite of computational uh, linguistic semiotics, which is what I'm going to focus today, which is uh, visual computational visual semiotics, right? I pair the relations between linguistics and the visual. Uh, I try to make relationships between the linguistic and the visual, and I try to argue what are the advantages and disadvantages of linguistics in relationship to the visual and the disadvantages of uh, the visual in relationship to itself and other systems and other computational systems. Uh, the first uh, notion that I want to uh, convey is the fact that uh, the metaphysic project of computation has been there for a long time. Uh, Aristotle uh, had uh, an envisioned a system of syllogisms, uh, which he called organon, in which he describes uh, ways to uh, rule out ambiguity. The ruling out of ambiguity is the basic of an algorithm, right? An algorithm is actually a way to, uh, in binary terms, to actually rule out ambiguity. Aristotle thought about that. How can we rule out ambiguity uh, in relationship to what he calls the loss of thoughts? And he discusses analytics, logical, and sophistical refutations in relationship to uh, logical statements. Uh, this is a long time ago, right? We're talking about uh, 350 uh, before the Christian era. Uh, the other, uh, and I'm develop, I develop a, a little bit of a genealogy of the uh, of the interests that are related to uh, my theory of computation. This is a, a very particular and subjective section. That's why I uh, I argue uh, Tafuri section of history, right? I develop my own section in order to create an argument, and there are other. Uh, avenues that one can follow. So this doesn't mean that this is the truth, but this is uh, helping me build up an argument. Uh, the second uh, problem that I'm interested in is the char Characteristicas Universalis of 1666 uh, of Leibniz. Uh, the, uh, he called it in many different ways, Dissertatio de Arte Combinatoria, or uh, diagram of reasoning, in which he tried to articulate mathematic science and metaphysics. To me, uh, this is an important uh, problem. He owned the I Ching, so that's an important fact in history, and he added numerical values to the I Ching and, and alpha numeric. So he was concerned about the problem of uh, language and the problem of mathematics and how to combine science in relationship to uh, language and mathematics. So to me, uh, he had embedded the metaphysics of computation already. And he called it, of course, for a universal formal language. Uh, if you are familiar with language and linguistics in general, uh, uni uh, universal grammar is the subject matter of uh, uh, several linguistic uh, uh, researchers. And why is important? Because languages are not perfect, they're imperfect. And we need to aim to have a universal formal language that is able to contain all languages uh, so that we are able to expand certain languages. I argue, for instance, that uh, instead of English, uh, we should be using Sanskrit. Sanskrit, to me, is a higher level grammatical language, 
uh, of South Asia, 704 Christian era, and then with uh, edits, in which uh, the language itself has multiple ways of referring to reality, it has a more expanded way of conceiving reality, such as multiple plurals, multiple genders, and many of the things that we are trying to deconstruct today that are already embedded into Sanskrit. Uh, the other interesting uh, problem uh, of uh, closer to our era is Boolean George Bull and Boolean algebra or Boolean logic of 1834, uh, which is particularly an, an investigation of the laws of thoughts by Aristotle, but taken into uh, a binary yes no logic. And this is where uh, the beginnings of the logic of computation starts uh, uh, emerging. Of course, nobody paid attention to George Wolf or until uh, uh, Shannon actually uh, uh, included uh, a Boolean logic in his thesis of 1937. But before Shannon, uh, the universal Turing machine by Alan Turing devised a way of having a tape in relationship to a mechanisms that uh, would cal calculate uh, individual equations and then uh, in terms of uh, a series, we'll throw one calculation into a different calculation into a different calculation. And I'm going to show you um, some machines that were already uh, proposing that. Uh, the important thing about Klaus Shannon's uh, uh, theory is that he applies the Boolean logic to a logic, uh, a binary logic of uh, circuits. So for the first time, we have a yes no argumentation trying to rule out ambiguity in relationship to an electrical circuit. He based that on the telephone uh, switch uh, and he aimed to develop a mathematical universal communication system. Uh, the mathematical theory of communication came out as a thesis in 1937, as I said before, uh, but also uh, Shannon was a cryptographer and he envisioned the problem of the economic advantage of translating a message into encrypted data and then decoding that data after it's being transmitted uh, in terms of a digital uh, communication system, which we're going to actually discuss and also criticize because to me, uh, we have to do something there that I think is missing. Uh, Shannon developed uh, the principles of what is called today the information theory. The, uh, this series of uh, analog computer machines and digital computer machines were revolutionary and uh, in parallel to what I presented in the previous slide, which is related to, if you want more metaphysics, right? Ideas about how to address reality. And here, some of the same people were able to actually develop physical mechanisms that they prove the idea. And this is what uh, is so important about them and why I develop another section, which is uh, a compu uh, analog computation and digital computation, but the machines that actually prove the concept. Uh, the, in the year 200 before the Christian era, we already have the Antikythera anti machine that uh, was discovered, uh, that was, I mean, it was discovered a while ago, but recently there was a 3D scanning and a simulation and reconstruction that prove actually uh, its complexity more than uh, what was previously assumed. The Pascaline, which is uh, Pascal uh, calculator of 1649, uh, the Pascaline to me is quite revolutionary because it looks very similar to Alan Turing's uh, machine. That's why I put it here. The Calculus Ratiocinator by uh, Leibniz, which uh, already proposes a universal logical calculator, is actually a computational system to devise uh, uh, statements, not only to make uh, calculations, but actually its idea was actually to create a logical system and to compute a logical system. Then uh, in 1725, we have the Bouchon, uh, uh, Bouchon uh, uh, punch card, which uh, the Jacquard Lumi machine came up in 1804, which to me is also revolutionary because it devises a punch card, which is a digital system, is binary, uh, but it's analog, right? Uh, it's binary system, not digital, sorry, it's a binary analog, but uh, the binary system gives an, uh, an undirect order, which is encoded uh, to a looming machine that creates a textile weaving. Uh, already anticipating what Shannon was saying, the, the fact that the uh, 
uh, in information theory to me, the, the revolution of the jackal looming is that it's anticipating Shannon's information theory, that it's more convenient to translate a message into a, a different type of form, in this case, a binary punch card, in order to uh, produce a sequence of operations. Uh, the Alan Turing machine, uh, which we are all, all familiar because of the movie, I'm not going to go through it, but particularly the halting problem and Godel and the stability uh, we discuss in the book. And Klaus Shannon uh, did one of the first automata, working automata, which was uh, able to resolve a, ma a maze, a mouse that was able to resolve a maze through um, electrical impulse uh, by itself, right, in the 1950s. Uh, now, the important thing here uh, relative to languages is that, uh, and I'm going to say something that is controversial because a lot of people would not agree with me. On the one hand, we have computational linguistic semiotics, which I am trying to develop as a, as a not only as a theory in relationship to architecture, but a, a, a little bit of, a, of an independent field of study, which already exists, but I am trying to articulate in relationship to architecture. And on the other hand, uh, on the other spectrum, computational visual semiotics. Between these two uh, areas, I'm trying to develop two specific areas of knowledge that I think uh, they had not been developed enough, and I'm trying to expand them into new uh, disciplines. On the one hand, uh, linguistic semiotics deals with uh, programming languages, and computational visual semiotics deals with signs that are able to become visual signs, right? Such as a pixel, particles, uh, or points, which are the, the three basic uh, digital signs that I developed in the book. Uh, but also, um, I base this theory, of course, on the revolution of shape grammar, which actually is computation through form. And we're, going to, we're going to, not going to focus on that today, but I leave that to another lecture. Uh, but the controversial statement here is that mathematics to me is part of semiotics, is a type of language. I don't think that uh, aliens coming from another world are going to uh, discuss mathematics in our terms. I, I discuss in the book that mathematics is, is a decimal system because of our 10 fingers. So it's anthropo anthropomorphic and anthropocentric, meaning that it's not universal, uh, meaning that uh, aliens that may have different other fingers or different ways to count will have a different type of mathematics based on a different measuring system. Uh, and I think that here is where all the mess starts because what I'm trying to deconstruct is that computational linguistics have problems, mathematics have problems, and computational visual semiotics have problems. And how, what do we de what, how do we deal with them uh, in architecture? The first problem is that we cannot think outside of language. Uh, this is a statement uh, that I did not invent, but is something that uh, many linguistics have been thinking about. And there is another problem which Chomsky refers to, which is that uh, language produces a certain type of synapsis connections in our brains. And there are uh, CT scans of brain activity that actually confirm this now meaning that if you speak language, uh, English, uh, uh, all your life, or if you speak Arabic all your life, your actual brain neural connection synapses is different. And here is where uh, Chomsky's theory becomes revolutionary because Chomsky argues that the grammar of language is a way, uh, a structure that is more important than meaning. And that literally our brain synapses is structure after grammar, meaning that the grammar of language actually has a physical effect on our brains and allows us to understand reality in a certain spectrum. Uh, so for linguistic, for people that study language, uh, language itself is what allows you to be, to think about like what's possible thinkable. And if you don't deconstruct language, here's where the problem starts because you assume that you are understanding reality, but in reality, you're missing a spectrum of reality. Uh, so the discussion today tries to articulate uh, what are we missing with natural language processing? What are the problems of chat GPT? And what are the problems of creating images with chat GPT or based on uh, large language models? Uh, for Nietzsche, we have different uh, philosophers that actually uh, problematize language, and I have a genealogy in the book discussing them. Uh, Nietzsche says every word is a prejudice, meaning that 
in the world itself, we are already classifying. Uh, Wittgenstein, the famous Tractus Logico Philosophicus, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Uh, and Barthes says that language is the real author, that the in literature, the limit of language is uh, the limit of literature is language itself. Uh, then um, this to me uh, causes a problem with computational linguistic semiotics because computational languages are mostly based on English. There's a lot of people that actually realize that that's a problem. And uh, C, Python, any language, right, based on uh, grammar, in English grammar, already has embedded a certain structure of thinking. Of course, uh, we have different types of language that we want to discuss later from higher to low. And uh, we're going to see what are the, uh, the problems of that. The Renaissance, at, at least for the visual arts and architecture, proposed the system of representation as an author. And I uh, mentioned Brunelleschi, which is problematic because uh, uh, I tried to deconstruct how present still today perspective is. It's not that I am doing a claim for perspective, but all the things that I include in the book are uh, trying to criticize what uh, they mean. And I think that one of the problems of artificial intelligence today related to machine vision is that uh, we have the bias of perspective. And I think perspective is actually there all the time in a very conventional way, actually. Uh, uh, Negroponte claims that the computational system is the author, but then what happens with architects? What happens with designers? And that's what the book discusses. Uh, how do we elevate our level of authorship related to creativity and how much the system weights in terms of anticipating a certain degree of authorship. Um, Chomsky, I describe a little bit of what this means. I'm not going to uh, go in detail because uh, it's more developed in the book, but uh, Chomsky studies the problem of grammar and he disguised the fact that you can have a grammatically correct sentence, which actually doesn't mean anything. And he argues that grammar is autonomous and independent from meaning, uh, flipping the equation. And that's when generative grammar comes in. And I think that that's where uh, semantics is totally wrong. I think that today, uh, I saw an article uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago about the weight of semantics in artificial intelligence as an advantage. And that's, I think that's the problem that we have today, that semantics is totally biased. Uh, because of not of not understanding uh, this problem that Chomsky points out, that the grammar is in itself generative, meaning that semantics becomes irrelevant. Uh, so if we are going after semantics, we actually need to either deconstruct the bias of the culture or we need to deconstruct the structure of the grammar. Uh, Marvin Minsky, uh, we discussed in the book uh, the problem of uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, based on the theory of feedback and also um, the, the problem of language in relationship to syllogisms and uh, meaning related to machine vision. Uh, uh, and the other, other principles such as the double feedback problem that based on figure out and there's other cybernetics of cybernetics. Um, we discussed through the book uh, the problem of grammar prediction, which is actually a problem of the 1970s and it's uh, what uh, ChatGPT is based on, right? It's actually uh, ChatGPT uh, anticipates by a prediction model how much percentage of possibilities after one word is entered, the next word is predicted. And the more words you put in, the more prediction uh, accuracy builds up. So ChatGPT is basically a, a statistical problem that was devised very early on. But now we can functional because of the amount of data that we are able to access, which is also a problem because the data that uh, these uh, systems are accessing uh, breaks a lot of copyrights and uh, user uh, privacy uh, laws. Uh, so what is the uh, digital signifier? What is the signifier? Uh, I uh, do a genealogy of the relation between the sign and the signifier in relationship, of course, to the SOSUR. Uh, the Sosur says that the sign is the signifier over the signified. The signifier is the word, uh, and the signified is the thing that the word is referring to. Uh, but um, after a, an evolution of that relationship, what um, Jacques Derrida 
uh, figures out a clue in relationship to what Chomsky uh, was actually articulating, which, which is that the signifier itself can actually convey meaning. And this is where the problem starts, the struggle, right? The fact that when we name something, we're actually creating an object independent from what we are being named. Uh, and if we refer to semantics in chat GPT, the, the problem is that the semantics is actually referring to something which is itself a, an artificial construction independent from that something that is being constructed. Moreover, the grammar uh, through which that semantic is interpreted, it's itself generative. So we have two levels of uh, dissociation in chat GPT. One is meaning independent from the structure, and the other one is meaning in relationship to semantics. Um, this is a diagram that I developed in 2008 and 2010, in which I, uh, I was claiming that architects were working more on the left side of the diagram, and we needed to work, work with uh, non-linear algorithms, parallel processing, uh, and bifurcating uh, systems, which is blockchain, basically, and artificial neural networks. At the time, artificial neural networks, 2008, was a bad word, so I didn't use the word because of uh, uh, the problems uh, associated with it. But now, with the amount of data that we have, artificial neural network prove that they're actually working. And in architecture, we have different ways of drawing and different ways of representing. I discuss in the book the different signs and how architects draw in relationship to the systems that are provided to them, usually developed by a, a, a computer software developer, which is another separation that I problematize uh, during the book. Uh, but mainly, uh, one of the interesting things to me is the flip uh, in uh, the functionality of artificial intelligence, which is thanks to big data, that before we had simple algorithms, uh, sorry, complex algorithms with simple data, and now that equation flip. We have a lot of data and simpler algorithms. Uh, and that uh, the weight of statistics in relationship to algorithms start being higher, meaning that the statistical data is actually uh, challenging the model, the AI model. So we have data science and computer science a little bit uh, uh, competing against each other. So we have the model that anticipates the solution to a problem because you cannot do a software. In order to do a software, you need to anticipate what type of problems you're going to resolve. And data science is totally the opposite. That tries not to anticipate anything and through the data tries to depict what are the patterns and device what type of problem uh, is emerging. Now, of course, we have the problem of car fitting and other issues that we discuss in the book that are also biased, that are also model-based, but the idea of the scientific validation of big data is that the data will compensate the intuition. And in the book, we uh, jump back and forth with artificial neural networks and uh, convolutional ne neural networks. Artificial neural networks are more related to uh, language, although some Linguistic models use the CNN and the other way around, right? Com uh, com com convolutional neural networks are more related to the image, uh, image processing through convolution and uh, uh, pixel uh, decimation, uh, and uh, they have a different structure. Um, in the book, we go through these, these problems. We go through what is an architecture of information, uh, what are the type of uh, linguistic uh, signs, and what are the types of visual signs, and what are the formal problems in relationship to that in order to arrive to what I call the e-architect, which is how architects can develop new parameters, systems of reference and measurement to be able to expand authorship and uh, actually to create a, cert a certain type of emancipation from uh, the uh, what I call the, uh, what Marufakis called the digital feudalism that we live in today, in which ChatGPT is a black box system that is gigantic and an individual has no chance to compete against it. Um, so these are the digital signs, uh, some of them, of course. Every software is loaded with a digital sign and anticipates the type of problem through a matrix of what it can resolve. And I think in uh, computational visual semiot semiotics, this is a problem that the uh, computer space is already biased, as I claim in 2010, and how architects deal with that background is to me the most important thing. It's not so important to me the content, 
but actually how you struggle with the loaded bias ideological back. Um, and these are the sequence uh, of problems that I discussed, authorship, how to come up with an ahistoric process, what is a computation and architecture, which are not the same. Most of the time uh, we see architects doing architecture through computation, but in reality it's more on the side of the computer software programmer than architecture. And how we deal, how we can disguise and resolve an architecture of information. Uh, I think that we need to display, display the signifier Otherwise, uh, bias come in. Um, so here I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, chat GPT, natural language processing, and what are the problems of pixel-to-pixel uh, -pixel, uh, image processing that we're seeing every day in constant feed in social media and so on. Uh, one of the, the, the three areas, right? Computational linguistic semiotics, mathematical semiotics, and computational visual semiotics, uh, deal with the problem in different ways. And the idea here is to go back and forth to try to dis disclose how we can move forward. Uh, the, the problem to me of, uh, of computation relative to uh, people are scared of AI taking over. And I think, that, uh, I think that we are right to be concerned about it. I think that we are here. These are uh, different phases, binary, uh, computational languages, artificial neural networks, emerging computation, which is what I think we are doing today, and what von Neumann uh, anticipated, which is what will happen if this becomes ex exponential. Uh, in other words, today uh, we are working with artificial neural networks having self-editing algorithms, which they are able to uh, optimize themselves, right? Every cycle, uh, in a uh, non-supervised machine learning, uh, the cycle becomes more optimized. And the optimization of that cycle makes the computation more effective. In some cases, it's able to recognize a feature in the data and it's able to create its own program. And this is what the scary and interesting part comes in, that this is called uh, what I call and other people call emergent programming. And that's what I'm aiming for. I think that we can do with natural language processing emerging pro programming, but the problem is how do we achieve that in relationship to the different uh, language levels? So we have low level language, programming language, which is assembly and the machine language. We have low code, which is visual algorithms such as Heroscoper is, is considered a low code. Then we have natural language processing uh, based on stochastic grammar, which is what uh, uh, we're all working with today. Then we have prompt engineering, which is grammar based. And then we have the high level programming languages, which is what software programmers do. We have to be uh, careful because on the one hand, natural language processing, yes, you can active a high level language uh, uh, programming level, but it's not the same. You cannot replace it. Of course, it's becoming better than programmers, but you need to know why or when or how to edit uh, because the thing that it gives you, uh, ChatGPT, the thing that it gives you, even it gives you the, the Python result, is an optimization and uh, it doesn't know the, 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 the meaning, right? And it doesn't really have knowledge embedded. It has knowledge in a certain minimal level, but it's not the understanding of the knowledge. Uh, and here we are, uh, this is what I'm dealing with now. I'm trying to create a morphogenesis out of a computational system that can actually literally evolve uh, in order to achieve emergent programming. And this is a step be before the singularity, right? This is where everybody's concerned about. Von Neumann, by the way, uh, is the person uh, you are familiar with. He devised the Manhattan Project. He was one of the uh, responsible for the atomic bomb. He was interested in, in the self-implosion, in the exponential logic of the self-implosion. And actually, artificial intelligence is being compared to the atomic bomb because of this idea of implosion. It's actually based on an idea of emergent implosion. So the singularity of AI can be given by an idea of self-simulation becoming exponential and exploding or imploding, and the fact that data is everywhere and that because of the internet of things, the entire world is wired and the more wired and more data gathering you have, you're actually increasing the dimensions like our brain functions of data circulation until a point in which the information flow can become actually uh, self-conscious. 
And that's the AI emergence uh, problem. Um, I claim that uh, you know we, we went through all the systems. We started working with ChatGPT uh, early on, 2020, 2021, and 2022. So we follow the evolution. We first started working with language, uh, language uh, prediction language in relationship to cellular automation, creating floor plans out of a text, uh, out of a, a predictive text. But uh, in relationship to, to images, this was was happening, right? The fact that uh, in 2017, NVIDIA, 2017, 2021, NVIDIA started developing, uh, you probably know because of the GPU, uh, artificial neural network become more efficient uh, because of the processing uh, chip that NVIDIA developed for video cards. Uh, and in 2017, the problem of uh, the GANs, right, generative adversarial networks based on semantic segmentation uh, became what was called style transfer, right? That you could actually identify features uh, in, a, in, a, in an image and then transfer that style into a different image. Now, there are different processes of that. One is convolution, which is more sophisticated, but the other one is uh, based on image tagging, image net, which has been uh, highly problematic because of the bias, right? Uh, is uh, image uh, net is based on linguistic bias. And this is what I'm claiming that is a problem because we're saying black, white, and I am not white, I'm not black, nobody's black, white, right? The, we are projecting a signifier into people's color of skin and then creating a problem with that. That's what's uh, the bias in the data because the images are being tagged following a linguistic bias and a grammatical bias. So uh, when you do uh, semantic segmentation, the semantic to me is bias, uh, sky, uh, column, ceiling, floor, right? They're all bias because they are based on conventions. So how do we do architects that we actually trying to deconstruct conventions? Uh, and I think that uh, ChatGPT is working uh, 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 such as through mid journey and so on because it's interpolating. But the problem of the image tagging bias uh, is there. We develop a way to surpass that problem through emerging programming, but still is there. So one of the issues of pixel to pixel uh, uh, diffusion models uh, was a little bit anticipated by certain uh, software programmers that were working with art. Uh, and I argue that uh, the stereograms was actually something out there is not uh, computationally doing the same thing, but there were textures that started to look like images. And when you um, work with efficient models, right, the noise and denoise function, right, is based on actually von Neumann's, uh, von Neumann is a person that comes through the entire book uh, in our case, because von Neumann relies the idea that uh, the efficient models are based on, that you can actually create order out of disorder. So he based uh, a theory on uh, resolving uh, uh, deterministic models out of non-determination. If you are familiar with thermodynamics, thermodynamics is about simulation and non-determination. And what von Neumann did was actually to devise ways to resolve through thermodynamics certain specific problems. Uh, the diffusion models are based on thermodynamics. Uh, there is a noise that through thermodynamics deconstruct the images into noise, literal pixel noise, and then the an adversarial uh, 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 convolutional process tries to reconstruct everything back again. The um, relationship between diffusion models and uh, image making is very interesting. Uh, we started uh, this in, back in 2022 in July when, um, when uh, Mid Journey started being available for us. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously the interpolation is very interesting uh, and it creates a lot of complexity, but uh, how do we, you know, the, the, the more you train the models through convolution, right? First, we initiate a linguistic uh, prompt engineering that becomes a higher uh, language level. We try to activate a higher language level because I know some grammatical uh, issues in computation that can trigger certain problems and then create a high, uh, uh, level uh, programming language and activate an actual program, an emergent program. But we 
discovered that there was a limitation. The limitation in the image making was exactly the semantics, that the image gives you what linguistically you're imagining. But through convolution, you can actually train the model to actually uh, look for features and actually predict a different deviation from the linguistics. And that's what we were interested in. We also work with uh, 2D to 3D. I never published them. I, I know that a lot of people were doing this. We did actually very early on, 2001, 2021 and 2022, in which uh, we took a 2D image and we combined different techniques that were uh, developed in 2017 uh, in uh, uh, Google Colab. We were able to actually uh, develop an, a neural net that was able to combine perspective and um, depth math into a 3D simulation. Now, of course, uh, certain other software, uh, they have that embedded, but we were doing it actually creating our own maps and our own approximation systems and our own depth approximation uh, by coding. Uh, the problem of uh, mid-journey that you probably know is the API. The API is actually retrieving images real time without the authors of the images consent, breaking all international copyright laws. And so it's not only the bias of the semantics, the bias of the grammar, but actually the problem that this content belongs to certain people. And uh, the interesting thing to me that uh, nobody discusses and that we discuss in the book is the uh, digital feudalism, that the fact that it's a top-down uh, money-making machine that is profiting from the production of all over the world, activating a socialism when in reality the individual has to actually pay for it in a most brutal capitalism, right? So socialism for the top and capitalism for the bottom. That's what we are living in now. Why? Because if you want to compete with this, uh, we are trying to compete with them. If you want to compete with them, uh, it's very hard unless you unify computers in, in uh, large networks that we're trying to do, develop our own repositories and try to uh, elevate the level. This is a 2D to 3D uh, approximation point cloud. Uh, and we're actually uh, training uh, our own system to recognize uh, 2D to 3D, 2D pixel to pixel, but also 3D point cloud approximation into 3D approximation. The resolution of them are not really great. These are, some of them are 1,000 iterations, which takes a lot of time and a lot of money to do if you own uh, little resources. We do it in the cloud and still requires a lot of training, uh, but uh, we arrived to 5,000 epochs. Uh, and of course, the pre-trained, the GPT, uh, uh, chat GPT, which is pre-trained, we're talking about trillions, right, of uh, parameters and billions of iterations. So there's no way in our entire life with all the resources that we can manage that you're going to be able to compete with them. Uh, but this is a demonstration of what we can do by thinking about how to take uh, shortcuts and actually how to train our own systems. We get somewhere, we're actually predicting 3D. Uh, this is, we were one of the first ones, I think, to actually do this back in 2022 and early 2023, predicting a point cloud directly point by point, uh, obviously based on the definition of the model, but actually creating a 3D a, a prediction model out of the 2D model, not based on depth, but actually a total AI reconstruction. Um, we work a lot with uh, ChatGPT and uh, Midjourney, DALI, and all the systems available as everybody's doing. Uh, and I did my experimentation with mathematics, with topology, very interesting, but I was not happy. I was not happy because I believe that uh, we were not activating the real meaning of artificial intelligence until we arrived to this. This to me was a breaking point in my research in 2022 and the decision to actually publish the book, uh, which is that uh, I believe that we were able to activate emergent programming. Emergent programming is a very specific type of artificial intelligence. It doesn't really happen all the time. You have to train a lot the model to actually be able to do it. But uh, if you are familiar with definitions of intelligence, if you are familiar with definitions of information processing, and if you are familiar with one new one definition of artificial uh, life, he called it artificial life, uh, I believe that we were able to activate artificial intelligence. Uh, in 2022, which is 
through natural language processing, we were able to activate higher uh, level programming language, and we were able to activate a simulation of a simulation. Why do I say this? Because in this one, these are simulations, right? They are not simulations of a simulation. But in this one, there is a simulation of a simulation. Why do I say this? Uh, it's not only that the image is constructed by uh, uh, interpolation and statistic, but the I believe that there is an emergent program that is actually recognizing in 3D, which is what uh, the mid-journey is prepared to do. But the difference is that there is a running program over the simulation. So the mid-journey simulation is having a task, which is perspective, rendering, right, all these type of simulations. But we're actually activating uh, the beginning of a Sentinel, by the way, which is to actually model a computational fluid dynamic simulation in relationship to a previously simulated model. So this I call simulation of a simulation. I think it complies with the definitions of von Neumann. And I think that it's not the same, that I think that there are different levels uh, in uh, ChatGPT and different levels uh, in mid-journey and that the developers don't even know what the, the system is able to do. Why? Because we are dealing with parallel processing. Uh, and these are early experiments, uh, July 2022. Uh, these are more recent experiments. Uh, you know, I said that uh, pixel to pixel deals with thermodynamics and we're trying in all my work, if you know my work, I try to match the signal and the sign to index the system in which the sign is being produced. And what I'm trying to do here is a simulation of a simulation, but also to try to activate this digital signifier to try to deconstruct the digital signifier. So in other words, the thermodynamics that is going on to construct the pixel simulation, use it as part of the uh, model making, right? As part of the uh, simulation. And we are experimenting, creating architecture and the architecture here is linguistic and it's a problem. I actually don't like architecture to look like buildings. I prefer this, but uh, this is more what people expect for architecture, it's funny, uh, but I'm more interested in the thermodynamic system of the architecture of the architecture. Uh, so the politics of this data, uh, I think that they are everywhere. Uh, it starts with a survey uh, and I'm going to show some survey projects. It starts with data gathering, is in the uh, all data bases are biased because they are based on linguistic special features that are programmed, therefore they're anticipatory. Uh, and uh, the idea is how to move away from them. Uh, how can we build up ways to actually deconstruct uh, semantics, deconstruct the grammar uh, towards a higher level grammar, uh, how to think about neural networks in a different way, uh, so, for instance, one of the things that I criticize in neural networks is extreme decimation, signal decimation. And I discuss in the book the problem of stacking layers in making the neural networks very big to try to resolve a problem that we're not sure of because of a hidden layer. And the hidden layer is, is purposely there uh, to hold the key of the unstructured data. But the problem is that it expends excessive amount of energy. So millions of people are using mid-journey ChatGPT, wasting a lot of energy because of the uh, signal decimation. And I argue that uh, what, we're, what I'm trying to do uh, with biological neural networks or uh, analog computing is actually to come back to the fidelity of the signal in relationship to the computational system. Uh, another issue that we are going to discuss in a, in a future lecture is ther uh, thermodynamics as part of the problem of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, how to go beyond the linguistic paradigm in terms of uh, non-semantic by uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, so here quickly, uh, I'm going to finish uh, showing uh, some uh, data survey, big data that we have been actually working through many years, uh, some of the uh, generative processes that I work with, comparing back and forth here, this is on the on the left side, linguistic tagging, meaning you can do a, a semantic segmentation of the point cloud. We actually, I think we were one of the first ones to actually work. I, I was having this conversation with Andrew Saunders and uh, uh, Graciano Valenti, who's here. Thank you for coming uh, from Sapienza University. 
uh, when we were doing the three scans in, in Italy, the problem to me was the fact that the point was uh, totally unstructured data because it's RG value X, Y, Z. So how to assign value to a, a group of points that had no meaning. So we developed some algorithms to actually recognize semantic segmentation, but then that became the problem. And then later on in the last two years, uh, we have been developing non-linguistic uh, visual feature-based uh, segmentation. Uh, that is based on uh, neighbor, neighboring uh, relationships at the level of the point cloud. So these are the two uh, linguistic and non-linguistic paradigms that we're working on. These are big data series coming 250 million points, uh, semantic segmentation, classification, approximation, right? All the data sets and the value. We, uh, I'm going to discuss in a, in a, a future lecture, I want to get more in deep about the work of Romini, and Rinaldi, because I try to also deconstruct uh, the history of architecture relative to what we know about architecture by 3D scanning the buildings and sectioning them and reclassifying them. But today I just wanted to show you some work uh, since we're in the context of the Bene Genale and is some of the research of the students, some of the work that we did at NYIT with our students uh, in our research studios and uh, seminars. Uh, so for instance, 3D scanning with photogrammetry. Uh, the Met and the um, Guggenheim Museum and developing a big data repository, articulating the art repository collection in relationship to the building, augmenting the building and crossing back and forth between the Guggenheim and the Met. Very interesting project, uh, which allows us to uh, not only 3D scan, but actually take point by point and assign an agent to each point and create its, its own emergent logic, meaning that the building could be augmented into a virtual reality navigation as a type of model for a museum of the 21st century, and go back and forth between the API of the actual painting collection and the uh, retrieving 3D scanning, uh, the MET museum, and combining uh, what uh, Salma Katas, the student, called the uh, Museum of Babel, which was based on our studio of the Library of Babel, uh, rewiring all the three scanning through semantic segmentation and transferring it into the uh, Guggenheim spirals, but then changing the Guggenheim spirals also, right? And this is some of the work that is exhibited here now. Uh, I show some uh, some animations. We are dealing with a video card. I don't think they're going to run, but maybe maybe I keep them. You can see them online. Uh, some of these animations are online. But basically here we deconstructed the pixel of the uh, artwork uh, in order to actually reclassify it and distribute the pixel of the artwork in relationship to the, uh, to the uh, experience of the space. Well, it's not, it's not running. Uh, there you go. Um, so then the pixels of the artwork became the space, literally. Uh, this is the Met Museum, 3D scanning the Met Museum, 3D scanning the Guggenheim, and then combining them into uh, uh, the point clouds themselves, making them agent, each of them becoming an agent, and creating a model, but also the model deconstructing into a data set and deconstructing the relation between the data set and the model. So articulating really uh, um, data science and computer science and combining into a different type of architectural space. These are navigations of the reconstructed data set. And then these are more abstract, right? Reconstructions in which each agent, each particle, right? We, I said that we deal uh, with diffusion models with pixels, but also we do diffusion models with particles. Uh, so the particle system that is simulating a thermodynamics, it becomes itself an agent. And I'm going to show another project that also deals with that. Meaning that instead of having a, an overall structure, each particle becomes its own rhizome. But the, low, the less, I think that everybody was after the rhizome in the 1990s, and I believe that we were able to activate the less rhizome at the level of an architectural model through the 3D scanning and making the 3D scanning an agent, a multidimensional agent.
uh, and this is the last project, uh, three scanning of the high line, uh, 200,000 pictograms and millions of points done uh, by the students, right? So, uh, by the way, we don't deal with data repository. We develop our own data. We acquire our own data, and we train our data set, and we develop our own algorithms eventually, some of them. Uh, this is uh, non-semantic, non-linguistic segmentation based on neighborhood approximation. Uh, and these are when the, each point becomes its own agent, creating its own figuration. Uh, in this case, the, it was a social project of deconstructing the, high, the linearity of the highlight in relationship to local uh, art galleries. Uh, and, create, and also working with pixel-to-pixel -pixel diffusion models and articulating back and forth points and pixels. Uh, to create uh, a more dynamic way of understanding what is the logic of the point cloud in relationship to the data set and how the point cloud can come in nature. And when it becomes its own agent, you recognize its own task because it's unstructured data and starts looking, you know, obviously we work with different known algorithms, uh, but make our objectives be So this is all what I wanted to share. I apologize, it went a little bit beyond the time uh, expectation, um, but uh, hopefully uh, the, the, the lecture uh, was clear. Thank you so much. All right, so now I guess uh, we go to the discussion. So Graciano, I don't know if you want to join us, no? <laughs> But uh, Alexis is here, the respondent. Thank you, Alexis, for coming here. Yes. Thank you for listening and for. I think we are no, we are we're okay. We don't need because we are not here. Yeah. Okay. It's a, well, Pablo, thank you, thank you for the presentation. As usual, it's very passionate and precise, and a lot of precision in theoretical fields. And uh, first, I want to thank Pablo. Uh, Aurora and the New York uh, Institute of Technology for inviting me to participate to this event around the presentation of this, this new Pablo's books. Well, I also apologize for my, I think I lost my voice in the plane yesterday. I'm so loud. And the theoretical and experimental approach proposed in the book. <laughs> The definition of a new architectural signifier, a digital signifier, as now we know thanks to your presentation. So, among them, it has economy of language. Pablo's intent to reform the tool of architecture to develop an architecture of architectures. In addition to the historical panorama, which is in the book, the work contributes to modeling the logical laws, which from Aristotle to Leibniz characteristic universalis determines the ontological conditions of the relationship between what appears on what one can know on what on what one can express. From then on, we understand the continual critical approachments that we find in the book between data and signifiers and between information and representation. So I will be very brief after your precise presentation, but I have a few remarks. So the object of this work to me could be taken as a critical studying of what may be a special environment today produced by new technological tools and new semiotic, a new semiotic entities named a digital signifier. These semiotic entities let open a series of 
displacement in systems of representation, especially conventional, until the advent of a kind of, as the author says, a digital humanities. Of course, those structural statements does not come from nowhere. And it is particularly interesting to observe the way in the text, Pablo Herrera merged different philosophical traditions. One from the logical positivism that relates any fact with linguistic structure, including, as we all noticed, an anti-metaphysic aspect, probably inherited from the Vienna Circle on his manifesto published in 1921. Uh, the, I will remind later <laughs> the name of you know, this manifesto. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. It is the, the scientific condition of the world. Yes. Another tradition from, of course, from come from the deconstruction movements which I say in architectural terms, and this which take its origin to be in the semiotic debates opened by Panofsky's ecology theory or Peter Eisenman's lexical decomposition process. Here, to be brief, the sign is related to meaning from a syntactic relationship between the different elements of the formal structure as algorithm, for example, it could be true also for arithmetic structure. Even if Edmund Husserl, the German philosopher of the 19th proposed in one of his first books, Nem, I don't know if you know it, Nem precisely semiotic, in, 19, in 1891, that arithmetic finally relate to a simple sign game that is out of conceptual or cultural representation. So now, in order to open the debate about your work, behind operativity and technological performativity, behind the, as long as you reduce st uh, structural expression as a communication system, isn't there is a risk here to see appear a cognitivist reduction of the spatial experience to the detriment of its affective and sensitive Does this suppose that architecture can be generated by the codification process and reduced to a communicational system? Because to me, from a material artifact, architectural representation is correlated to perceptive abilities of the user and not only by the organizational logic of the shape or structure. Another and final word, <coughs> another and final word is the grammar exclusively empirical and correspond also to other dimension of our sensitive and aesthetical consciousness. How your digital signify will respond to that? From which point your digital signify became an architectural sign? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, by the way, I have to thank you uh, also for your, the Alexi Meyer's critique of uh, the book is actually included in the back cover of the book. Uh, it's actually very well written, so I, I really appreciate your your precision uh, and your expertise because you understand the problem very well. So I, I really appreciate your uh, your synthesis of the book. Um, I knew that, that that was coming, and and usually that that question comes. Uh, what about experience? I, I all my presentations, and it's because. I literally ran out of time in the in. I don't want to make my presentation twenty hours, right? But uh, my work, I am from Latin America, right? So I, I, my work is a reaction to my context. In Latin America, experience was first and material was first, right? So we start a, an architecture project out of the materiality and the experience. So I always question my professors. Uh, uh, you know, we, we talk about, the, for instance, one famous 
thing in first year, the teaching was the metaphysics, which is very interesting. And I totally agree now, right? Now that I, I look at it in, in years ahead, uh, the metaphysics of the gravity of architecture. That's to me the most powerful embedment of the experience. The fact that a building has to really deploy a lot of resources structurally, right? That's to me the point of contact between deep structure and experience. The structure breaking the metaphysics of architecture, which is what Le Corbusier did with the free plan, right? Elevating the building, um, or a, 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 some architects uh, do with a gigantic cantilever, right? That you you feel the presence of the absence of the structure and you get uh, scared, that's one. Uh, another uh, article that I wrote about that is uh, based on Palladio. Palladio to me uh, is an architect that uh, not by chance is one of, is, is an architect that defined architecture and why. In Palazzo Chiricati, I discussed the relationship between uh, experience and structure. And why the Palazzo Chiricati? Because Palazzo Chiricati is a very, compressed space, it's a series of layers, right? It's very compressed. So when you enter the building, you feel the pressure. So how do I transfer that into the digital signifier? This is your question. And what I did in the last chapter, and it's with virtual reality, what I did in the last chapter, uh, I tried to articulate in the last two chapters. On the one hand, the problem of virtual reality and an expanded reality based on uh, uh, the Prisker Prize winners uh, last year, uh, which they, I, I totally agree with them in terms of the, that we need to stop architecture developmentalism. We don't need to build more, right? So one way of not building more, that's what I'm doing with the survey, is actually expand the building virtually. But the interesting problem of the experience comes in if the eye of the beholder of each person experiencing the virtual reality is able to change the structure of the simulation. That's my, you know, and for instance, uh, there is a, a, a system that uh, uh, stereo diffusion, right? There is an AI system that allows you to change the camera and each time the camera changes, there is something grows by prediction, right? So we play in the last uh, chapter of the book with the fact that the camera, and we're actually developing a video game and uh, based on mood, uh, in the last Viennese Biennale in 2022, we did an, an installation, a pseudo installation because we didn't finish because of COVID, but we proposed a space that was recognizing mood in the subject experiencing the, the space, and that mood, AI sensing, would change the virtual simulation. Uh, right, real time. So that's one. And another one, but how do you arrive to the structure? That's what I'm interested in. How do you arrive to change the morphogenesis of the structure? And what I propose in the, in the last chapter, obviously you need quantum computing. You cannot do it uh, without a type of computation, which is that multiple people looking at the same space would be able to simulate themselves in parallel simulations changing the actual space. And then you have an adversarial construction through the point of view of each of the, and I developed the theory of it. We didn't resolve it uh, technically, but uh, the idea is that uh, an AI machine vision could actually develop a way of seeing that actually changes the structure of the space. So that's my answer to your, but I, I agree that, uh, you know, I first with this, I, I start with deep structure, but the objective is to arrive to experience and you can do it the other way around. You can start with experience and arrive to the structure. But in terms of computation, I think that we are actually loaded with images. There is too much affect and there is little knowledge because of uh, the fact that we, I think that we live in a totalitarian regime of, uh, of uh, big data, right? that very few people own everything, right? It's six companies that own all the data of the world, right? And that is a problem. So the question is how the subject can become an agent in terms of that, right? Okay. So I don't know if I answer your question, but that's what I'm trying to do in the last two chapters. You know, that is good precision and good example. Thank you. 
Uh, my observation is more related to the <clears throat> relation between the uh, expression of representation. I feel uh, through you, through the world, what, what you pursue, what you want to, to have finally is something that a kind of sign that can be out of representation. Because in representation, you find, as you say many times in the book, uh, there is some uh, kind of uh, determination, uh, cultural aspects, and also a kind of regression sometimes. But all that things that we all know from maybe from Eisenman studies on the side of this motivation, and I'm agreeing with this, of course. But <clears throat> my idea is how, <clears throat> how, how your sign could work as a sign, maybe a digital sign if you want to name it like this, uh, without this aspect of representation, because it is because our consciousness make a sign a sign from something. I think it's it does. So how could you escape predetermination and representation? I think that, yeah, I think that there are two things. There are two, two questions. One is representation. We, 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 when, when you play with some sign that people maybe can can't recognize recognize that exactly that, that's the same. okay so I, I i include a discussion in the book which i call the sign which is to deconstruct the sign right first you need to acknowledge the sign otherwise you cannot communicate right there's no message so palladio for instance was very aware of the construction of the context of the message how do you create a sign that you can deconstruct right so that's one aspect. But the problem of representation that you're saying, I don't agree. I, 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 in, the, in the book, I, I do a bet. Uh, my bet is uh, that we are in a representation restricted reality. We cannot access reality. I think that we cannot access reality other than a media or a medium. And that separation creates a struggle. And I think that most of the time, like for instance, ChatGPT doesn't recognize the mediation. They tend to normalize reality as if the system of representation is not an issue. And that's what creates the bias, the lack of deconstruction of the uh, recognition that there is a separation between us and reality. And that separation starts with language, the speech and the writing, and then it continues with perspective, drawing, and so on. Uh, I'm agree of the, with the fact that, of course, we don't live on we we take the reality to be our representation, but it's exactly. not the reality. By the way, yeah, sign only exists in our consciousness. Exactly, the aliens don't have. Of us. course, of course, for that I agree with. So my question is, how you make your sign out of representation and our ability to communicate? Is I think well, I, I included four steps uh, in the book. One is the analysis. I think that, for instance, one of the problems of image making in Chat GPT and Mid Journey uh, or all the AI systems is the lack of process. Like architects are not able to access the process. If you do not access the process, you cannot do analysis. So my first step is gather your own data. The data that you gather already includes a sign because you're going to use a measuring system to that gather the data. So the problem starts already in the survey. How do you measure reality? A sign or data? They, they, they are not separated because there's no data. That's the big difference. There's no data without representation, I argue. Some people believe that there is data without representation. I argue that there's no data without a system of representation. You cannot have, uh, in other words, a measuring system measures reality and stretches reality, if, uh, distorts know. reality. It's a debate. I don't know. I don't know. I say there is no sign without representation, but data, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, that's what I discussed in the book. I, that's why I start with human proportions. Uh, because everything is anthropocentric, and how do we go beyond anthropocentric systems? And I think that, the by the way, the crisis of the environment, I think, is related to our, our anthropocentric systems of measurement. That we don't we understand nature as the other, 
because we are understanding nature linguistically as a signifier, and we are not part of nature. That's why actually uh, pre-Columbian or uh, uh, pre-Columbian uh, uh, civilizations don't have that problem. They don't. They, they are not separated from nature. I think that uh, one of the Eurocentric problems is that we are separated from nature and uh, linguistically, right? Is the other uh, nature even from the Maya is also a representation. Yeah, of course. So, the, nature they, doesn't exist. They, of course, they right? exist in their consciousness. Exactly. School structure of nature is a construction that is gained by long with that. Just to pick up your last example that just show at the end of the presentation, which I found very interesting, this remark, just to know better about it, maybe to solve some kind of theoretical problem about it, is the, what, uh, again, what uh, the Husserlian theory, uh, maybe the, at, not at the end, but at the last part of his work, uh, speak about intersubjectivity. And he speaks about intersubjectivity through the problem of experience and judgment. And he repaired that uh, uh, only the semiotic mechanics can solve the problem of intersubjectivity. And I found what you, your intuition to mix and to let six uh, as a kind of auto organization, different uh, or parallel point of view, could be maybe rather, that's, rather, rather, that's rather, a rather, problem. That's a problem, I actually think, because. And to finish, of course, what is difficult is the represent that you have the design when you design it or you draw it or you program it. How do you know that the people that in, in their consciousness have the same representation that you want to make not the same signification? It's the basic of the architectural model. I think Palladio was a genius on that because Palladio did an, a machine exercise to introduce you to the problem. Like he gave you the that's what uh, 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 Terrani did in the Casa del Fashion, right? He gave you a reference system, which then he alters, right? I've seen all the genius in architecture. Do that. They, they do that. Yeah. They, they do a, a, like a, a pedagogy, uh, right? A, a, sure. a deconstruction of what architecture means and a teaching of what architecture is. Exactly. Sure. But uh, Husserl, uh, the problem of Husserl, I think, uh, by the way, video game is a it's a video gamer's dream is to do that. The fact that the video game can be developed by a user, right? The user experience constructs the, the screen. I remember Graciano when Graciano was working very early on in BRML when you did the, the, the model for 2004 uh, of the Venice uh, installation. Uh, you were working in BRML already, and I was thinking, you know, like, uh, actually, Michele was, was he's also here, he was. Uh, he built the, you remember, right? He built the, he actually built the installation. <laughs> so the, the, the VNL problem, which was a subject moving in the space, was already the, the activator to me as a problem. How is the user would be able to change the morphogenesis? It's very complex because you have the morphogenetic system. Uh, you have the, by the way, I, I, I talk about site based computation, right? Uh, similar to the problem of the, of the subject is the problem of the context. Like, can you do a computation that is based on the context? And in the last five chapters of the book, we discuss uh, what is uh, site based computation, which is the problem of cell automation. And cell automation, in terms of um, generative process, could eventually lead to a problem of the subject. The subject is not included in cell automation, but that's what we're trying to do. But the subject is included in automation. Yes, uh, the, what, but, whatever but, you do. But, and, but the problem is that it's perspective. Why do we still deal with perspective, right? And, and I think that we have a struggle because uh, my, uh, AI vision is all based on perspective. How come? And we're 500 years away from perspective, and still Brunelleschi is winning. It's like the hero here is Brunelleschi. And I'm trying to deconstruct Brunelleschi, right? I'm not trying to confirm. I'm, uh, I include uh, what Velasquez did, right? That Velasquez tried to break uh, the, the subjectivity of a perspectival point of view by inserting himself into the painting, right? 
uh, or what Palladio does against perspective, right? That flattens the space. So there is a lot of uh, discussion about uh, what are the, the resources that architects have in order to resist uh, this the signifier, right? And that's what I'm trying to to develop new signs and new signifier. Yeah, as long as we have in mind that when you deconstruct an architecture outside, traditionally you deconstruct the semantic charge of the sign, exactly. not the sign in itself. That's and that's problem. that's a problem, yeah, of course. That's a problem because if, if, if it was only easy to to deconstruct the sign exactly. to change the meaning. But that's the, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised how everybody forgot uh, this because that's uh, the main question. Yeah, but if you read the articles on AI uh, published lately, they're all supportive of semantics. And I say, what, what are you talking? I mean, we forgot the last forty years of architecture, uh, and I think that obviously they are reacting against formalism. But you can only uh, talk about grammar if you're a formalist. You cannot avoid the formalism of grammar. And I think that that's a problem that, that certain architects that they try to do well, you know, that I'm trying to, I'm, that they say, my political project goes against form. Yeah, good luck, because how can you uh, make sure, that's what the reader says, how can you make sure that you're not applying what you're trying to resolve, right? That's, the, that's a problem, my problem with politics in architecture done in the wrong way. I think I'm doing politics through the signifier. But if you do it without the media, on the medium, you fell into the trap that you're trying to do good, but you're projecting the same structure that you're trying to resist. Derrida uh, was aware of that. When he critiqued uh, uh, the, uh, the, the socialist structure, structuralist, right? He was pointing that out, right? People that were going uh, to decipher the myth, but then they were falling into the same Eurocentric structure that they were trying to depict, right? Yes, but have in mind that what there it does say that the end of his architecture has to be is that if you deconstruct architecture, there is no more architecture. Yeah, but that's so but, we, we yeah. are in between. Exactly. That's why the problem Absolutely. is the interesting that one that's but you can live too far. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right. I don't know if uh, there is any uh, questions from <laughs> The audience or Marcella, if you have any comments, uh, um, but uh, or if you, oh, Mark Graciano, I don't know. yes. Hi. So yes, thank you. I have some comments, but I don't know if we want to go to the in person first. Mostly, yeah. They are shy. Uh, they're a little okay. shy. So I have yeah. actually two questions, maybe as a bridge. And so thank you for the presentation. It was uh, very rich and very dense, but I think it was great to see the body of work in terms of how, you know, in a way, the, how, you know, the research started and how this evolved up to now. So as an overall framework. Uh, so I want to, uh, so my question, two, two reflections here. So I think uh, uh, very interesting, you know, when we, we, you know, that we cannot really think outside the language and really this dichotomy between uh, grammar and meaning is the really the base, let's say, problem that in a way start to, you know, uh, it's really the base problem, I think, to begin to address. So uh, where basically, in a way, if you look at meaning and we look at semantics, we understand that semantics are not relevant. So my first question is that, um, uh, how do we, um, so how do we give back semantics, but also what type of semantics we can give back uh, through uh, through this ne new level of authorship? And uh, so this, I think, goes back to the other question, because in the way, in the end, it's how do we elevate, you know, one of the part of the discussion is how do we elevate the level of authorship and, uh, and how we can begin to address this notion of expanded author authorship as well. And so this is when you, you started talking about the emergent programming as a type of AI that can be introduced to basically bypass this pro you know this problem somehow. And so I think at the end, when you show the images that look at how we can begin to bypass the bias of the signifiers, I mean, this to me it's really the the, the you know the 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 center part, I think, of the presentation as an endpoint. And so this, I think, uh, and you started talking about that emergence programming as a new type of AI also uh, you the, the key in the end is how you train the model and so my question here is uh, how do you how do you train the model in order to bypass the biases as well 
So in the end, these two questions, right? How do we begin to engage uh, through the practice, this expanded level of authorship, uh, also in the training the models? And the second one it's, uh, uh, is, is a more question related to this dichotomy between meanings, meaning semantics and grammar, and what type of uh, semantics we can think of as well. Well, the, the pro thank you, Marcela. Um, uh, the problem of semantics is that is uh, that is interpretative and is subjective, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about subjectivity before right. uh, this puzzle, but this is a, a, a problem. Semantics is a problem because, uh, and this is my my fight with computation in general because Shannon, Cloud Shannon, uh, uh, and this is something that I'm very clear in the book device the uh, the fact that the message is scrambled into data communicated because of an economic problem and then reconstructed again right that's information theory my information theory uh, that can only be done with semantics by the way the signal transmission means that the message is at the level of semantics because the, the meaning is deconstructed into meaningless bits and then reconstructed again into meaningful bits that become information. So data becomes information. Uh, I think that I was one of the first ones to declare that problem, that that to me is the bias of computation. That is computational software developers not studying humanity, basically. Like, uh, and I think that there are new... For instance, in the 1970s, there was a, a field of knowledge that was computational art, that uh, where artists were developing their own software because they were realizing all that. Uh, uh, that became media theory, and uh, right. And I, 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 I going to the, your question of the author, I think that the author, we had to recover that project of the 70s in terms of developing our own coding, uh, because if we don't do that, we fall into a colonial, uh, colonialism. I argue, I, I don't think anybody said this before, but I argue in the book that computation is a, uh, a neo-colonialist system. And that's why the big data, uh, the, the big companies are doing better, right? Technology and capitalism are part of the same equation and the bias are a consequence of that capitalism. The more you spread the system, the more universal, the better, but that becomes a, an empire, right? An empire of Google, an empire of Facebook, and I think that the, the neo-colonial problem has to be deconstructed uh, at the level of authorship because today, and one of the things that I say in the book that is, I think people are going to be a little bit uh, nervous about what I'm saying, but I say uh, in the book that if you don't own the means of production, you are not the author, literally, right? In other words, if you don't develop your own, uh, your own oh. algorithms, if you don't develop your own data, to me, you're not the author. And uh, there are different legal, I, I discuss authorship and authority in the book, in the last chapter, uh, legally, right? Uh, because I, I met with different lawyers and they orient me in terms of what's going on with, uh, with the law at the level of, of uh, digital uh, science. And it is a big problem. And I think uh, everybody's looking the other way, pretending that they don't know while the big companies are having everything, right? They're taking everything from us. So I think that uh, relative to your question, the semantics is something that we need is bias. Semantics to me is biased. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the semantic, if you look at semantics, I, there was an article by Stanislaw uh, Chila, which was, I was somebody that I was following, uh, a student of, um, um, What's his name? Uh, he, he works with architecture and mathematics. I don't remember his name now, uh, from Harvard. Um, and his thesis was one of the working thesis on, on AI. And I knew that that was a problem, but now he wrote an article in, I think, Arch Daily or Archinect, Archinect about semantics. And I said, oh, this guy is lost. He's totally lost. So you know what I mean? Like, I think that uh, the confirmation of semantics is very dangerous because it's a confirmation that we have no power against the big data companies. It's like saying, okay, if we if we are the ones that provide the meaning, that's why I'm not interested in creating images with Mid Journey as everybody is doing, because the meaning production that's not that's to me that's irrelevant. It's not important. Uh, we can do millions of images, but if we don't access the process, uh, we are not part 
we are actually well, what I claim in the in the book is that we are the product. We become the product of because we are training uh, the the system. We're actually helping them to take us out. You know what I mean? It's like it's terrible because we are helping them train to push our authorship down okay. instead of doing the other way around. So that's I think yeah. that we should do this, and we are doing every every time we're more away from creativity and authorship. Yeah, because in the end, it's about, I mean, the whole core here is bypassing the biases. That's it, right? Because in the end, when you put Sky into mid-journey, there is already a bias that you mean, okay, I mean, Sky is that. And so there is an associated image that will basically use that word specifically to get that output. I mean, the, the bias is being dissociated by interpolation. We have to be careful and by convolution, but uh, without knowledge, you know, and that's when the danger comes in because, yeah, you can bypass through interpolation and and feature uh, recognition Except, through yeah. evolution, you can go beyond the bias, but uh, not really beyond the reference bias. And that's when, to me, the problem starts. And that's why, to me, uh, the only solution is to go beyond the structure of the system, uh, which I've been claiming since 2010, right? How do we deconstruct the uh, structure of the system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is difficult, uh, but that's, that's what... Uh, uh, by the way, the, developing your own media, right, uh, is the challenge today, uh, and developing your own medium. That's what I'm claiming. And hopefully I'm able to, to work more on that level now that I, I finish the book uh, in different projects. Uh, but that's that's what we're trying to do. But thank you, Marcella, for, for the comments and the feedback. I don't know. There are some comments in the chat. Uh, Marisa, uh, is algorithms for authorship. Looking forward to evolving to further questions. Thank you, Vanessa. All right. I don't know if there is any other questions or comments. Okay. The audience here is, is shy. It's very shy. The, the English, maybe Italian. <laughs> but all right. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Hope uh, that uh, you. you buy the book <laughs> and uh, we continue the conversation. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bye -bye. Marcella. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.